Good evening and thank you for joining us in a new series and a new opportunity for you to help to solve a major crime. As always, we're live. There are 20 phone lines ready here and dozens more in incident rooms around the country. And detectives and BBC researchers are waiting for your call. We have news tonight of progress on some of our previous appeals. Another Aladdin's cave of property recovered by police, some of which, you never know, may look familiar to you. And three new reconstructions. The couple on a hiking holiday who went missing on a clifftop path in Wales. A gang of bank raiders near Edinburgh who made an elaborate getaway across the Lothian countryside. And in London, the shooting of a courageous young musician who attempted to foil an armed hold-up. The first of tonight's reconstructions is a case that made the headlines. The disappearance of those two walkers, Peter and Gwenda Dixon, on a clifftop path in Pembrokeshire. It happened at the end of June, a time when thousands of tourists were in southwest Wales. Many of those holidaymakers have since returned to the area to help police with the inquiry. Now, some of them have helped to make a Crime Watch reconstruction. It begins at a campsite where the couple had been staying. Hello, Harrelson Farm. Hello, is that Miss Davis? Yes. Oh, it's Tim Dixon here. Um, I'm concerned about my parents. They were due back this weekend, and in fact they were due back at work today, but they haven't turned up yet. Are they still at the campsite? Well, the tent's still here, and your father's car, but I haven't seen them for a few days. Something's not right here. They wouldn't just leave the car in the tent. Uh, I think you'd better ring the police. Could you contact me after he's done that? By now, it was four days since Peter and Gwenda Dixon had been seen here at Halston Farm campsite. The Dixon's holiday had begun two weeks earlier, on Monday, June the 19th, when they arrived here from their home in Oxfordshire. 24 pounds, 50 pence. It's even cheaper than last year. Well, you are earlier this year, and we are cheaper in June. Thank oh. you. We'll probably stay a second week if the weather holds. It was so good this year, we decided to come away before it changed. Well, if you decide to stay, you can settle before you leave. I hope it oh. stays fine for you. They'd been visiting this site for 16 years, and so they knew the area well. Both Peter and Gwenda Dixon were very fit. They enjoyed walking and loved the Pembrokeshire countryside. They'd been happily married for 27 years and had two children. One of them, their son Tim, joined them on holiday for a couple of days. And a jumper and a life jacket when you want it. CQ, CQ, CQ. Golf Whiskey Zero. Hotel Foxtrot Quebec Mobile. Golf Whiskey Zero. Peter was a keen radio ham and often spent hours on end contacting other enthusiasts. If you heard his call sign, or if you spoke to him by radio at the end of June, please call us now. Foxtrot, Quebec, Mobile. Golf, Whiskey Zero, Hotel Foxtrot, Quebec, Mobile. Does anybody read? The village of Marlowe's is about five miles from the campsite. It's the day before the Dixon's disappearance. At about 9 a.m., two men were noticed walking away from the post office. Later, the same witness saw the same two men about two miles from the campsite at St Bride's Crossroads. Do you know who they were? The Dixons were also in Marlowe's that morning. They asked a farmer if they could drive across his land towards Dale Airfield. Yes, this is for the radio telephone, and these two are for my radio receivers. You get quite good range from high spots like the airfield. Oh, yes. Is that why you're going up there now? No, as a matter of fact, I'm uh, going to see a friend I contacted on the radio. Turns out he's holidaying in the area too. Thanks. Dale Airfield is abandoned, an old wartime base perched above the sea, but popular with tourists because of its clifftop views. Did you see the Dixons here that morning? Did you meet them? Or did you hear Peter Dixon transmitting on his radio? Next day, the day they disappeared, breakfast time on Thursday, June the 29th. And though it's a fine morning, the weather had worsened and the previous night it had rained heavily. A 
About a quarter of a mile from the campsite at Hasgard, Susan Beddoes was taking her children to school. Two cyclists caught her attention. Here we go, Tall Benny. Where are the havens? Tall Benny. It seemed they were heading towards the coastal path via the village of Talbeni. Dispirited by the erratic weather, Richard Lines, who was camped next to the Dixons, was packing up morning. to leave. Morning. How are you this morning? Oh, a bit fed up with this weather. We decided to go home today. Yes, we've had enough too. What time are you off then? How about midday. We're going for a walk along the coastal path first towards Dale. Give the tent time to dry out. Oh, must be off. Bye. Richard Lines was the last known person to have a conversation with the Dixons. Campers remember seeing the couple set off for their walk at about 9.30. From here, there are no known witnesses. But if the Dixons did take the coastal path towards Dale, this is the way they would have come. Just before 11, Richard Lyons and his wife left the site. They were the only people that knew the Dixons were planning to return home that day, so no one was alarmed when the couple failed to return. Shots were heard at about 11 o'clock, but in a farming area like this, gunshots are not unusual. In Pembroke, at 1.30 that afternoon, someone used Peter Dixon's cash card at the NatWest Bank in Main Street. Whoever it was knew the correct PIN number, but was not familiar with a cash dispenser. He asked for £37, a sum not recognised by the machine. Almost immediately, he corrected his mistake and withdrew £10. Meanwhile, at two that afternoon, a family was walking along the coastal path close to Tolbeni Church. They remembered the man because his behaviour was so peculiar. 4pm, back in Pembroke, and the cyclist was using Peter Dixon's card again. This time, he withdrew £100. A few doors down from the bank is the John Bull store. Someone spent £40 here on a new pair of walking shoes. It's three o'clock the next day, Friday the 30th of June, in King Street, Carmarthen. A different man was seen in the vicinity at about the time that Peter Dixon's cash card was used again. There was a blue Ford Sierra parked close by. And one day later, on Saturday the 1st of July, Nicholas Elliott was driving through Halford West on his way to work when, at 7.15 a.m., he passed the Nat West Bank in the High Street. From this sighting, police made this artist's impression. Police believe that same cyclist was still in Halford West some four hours later in the Whole Food restaurant in Key Street. For two days, the RAF, police, coast guards and national park wardens searched along the coastal footpath, suspecting that the Dixons had fallen from a cliff. What they found was worse than they had feared. Just after 3pm on Wednesday the 5th of July, a police dog discovered their bodies at the edge of the cliff top, carefully hidden by branches. Gwenda and Peter Dixon had been killed with a 12-bore shotgun. Clive Jones, whoever was using the cash card is obviously critical to this case. Crime Watch has been able to enhance the original artist's impression. What, what do we know about this man? Well, there is no doubt at all that he is the person uh, that we need to identify and is the person who cashed Mr Dixon's cash card. I feel that one of the persons who can help us with this and can certainly help us identify him is the fair-haired youth from Marlos, who was in his company the morning before the murders, uh, which we saw in the reconstruction earlier. He's obviously on a hiking holiday in the area, walking, 
and split up from the cyclist shortly after going through Marlois. I appeal to him if he is watching, please ring us. Now, there were a lot of holiday makers in the area uh, at that time. I think you, you've worked out about 1,200 so far. Presumably the ones you need to talk to most critically are those who were on the cliff top path on that 29th of June. Yes, indeed, and we're aware that there were 76 persons who walked that uh, wooded area of the coastal path between the morning and early afternoon. We've traced 40 of these, so there are still 36 people we need to speak to who went through the area. Uh, particularly, there are two males who came over a stile at Burrow Head at about 10 a.m. Uh, one is aged about 50, the other 30. They were casually dressed and they walked into the wooded area and should have seen or met up with Mr and Mrs Dixon. OK, but if anyone was in the area around this time at the very end of June, you need to, you need to hear from them. Yes, absolutely. What about the campsite? I mean, at, at Halston, I know Miss Davis didn't keep names and addresses of everyone. Why should she? So you haven't been able to trace everyone who was there at the time the Dixons were? No, there are two caravans in particular that we can't trace the occupants of. Number 45, which was occupied by four adults and a child, and a red car and a touring caravan, which was occupied by two fair-haired males with short hair who were extremely fit and could have been uh, from the army. And if anyone had tents there as well and hasn't yet contacted the police or been contacted by you, you want to hear from them as well? Yes, indeed, there? yes. Now, tell us about uh, this. I know these are replicas of, of what's missing from, from Mr Dixon. Yes, uh, Mr Dixon's brown fold of a wallet was stolen, similar to this. It contained seven, uh, seven credit cards, a telephone charge card and his driving licence. Uh, these make up an unusual array of credit cards and some of them, particularly the Trust House 40 gold card, is not something that uh, a large number of people would carry. OK. Well, as I say, it, it might be quite difficult to remember what you were doing on the 29th of June, but you'll know if you were on holiday in this area, and if you were, and if you were on that coastal path in particular, or if you were at that campsite around that time, please contact us. If you think there's anything that you can add in any way, here's the number, 01811 Mr Jones and his team are here. If you prefer, you can ask to speak to a BBC researcher. Other members of the team are standing by at the incident room in Carmarthen. And the number there is 0267 235 101. That's 0267, the code for Carmarthen, 235 101. Well, looking back to our last programme in July, you may remember our reconstruction of events leading up to the death of Gordon Johnston, who was the manager of a gun and sports shop in Dundee. About a hundred calls came in from Crime Watch viewers on the night and new information continued to come in for some time afterwards. Two men have been arrested now in connection with the death of Mr Johnston and are in custody. In our last programme we showed a clip from a security video of a robbery in progress at a jeweller's in Brookman's Park in Hertfordshire. Thirty people called us and as a direct result of information from Crime Watch viewers, three men have been arrested and charged with the offence. In addition, one of the three has been charged with the previous raid on the same premises and two further people have been charged with receiving stolen property. And a photo we showed led to a number of calls about a man whom police want to speak to in connection with a series of deceptions. Several viewers gave one address, though when the police called at it, the man had gone. But a man of similar description was spotted going into a house not far away. A man has now been committed to Manchester Crown Court, charged with fraud. Pictures now of more people wanted for questioning. If you recognise these faces, please call us straight away. Here to take us through them is Superintendent David Hatcher. First, my colleagues in Maidenhead need to trace this man who robbed the Nationwide Anglia Building Society in Cookham, Berkshire, on the 21st of July. He produced a handgun from inside a Waitrose carrier bag and demanded the cashier hand over some money. He got away in a stolen white Ford Granada, which has since been recovered. He's in his mid-twenties, five foot seven, well tanned, with dark hair. He had a faint Mexican-style moustache and wore a blue baseball cap. His accomplice, who drove the Ford Granada, is about 40, with a tanned complexion and short, dark, untidy hair. If you recognise them, please let us know. Next, Northampton Police would like to speak to this couple, Elizabeth and John Scheel. They may have information about the disappearance of over £100,000 from the central post office in Northampton where Elizabeth Scheel worked. They were last seen on Friday the 23rd of June, getting into a taxi outside their home at Marshwell Court, Little Billing, Northampton. Mrs Scheel is 44, 5 foot 3 and of heavy build. Her husband is 37, 6 foot tall and of medium build. There's a possibility that they've changed their hair colour since these photos were taken. 
but have you seen them since Friday the 23rd of June? If so, please contact us now. And finally, Strathclyde Police would like to interview this man, Gordon Johnston. He may have information about a series of crimes, including theft and fraud, which have taken place during the last two years. The victims are elderly and often blind or disabled. They're offered food parcels or cheap bus rides. Then their purses or wallets are snatched. Similar crimes have taken place as far apart as Glasgow, Blackpool, Great Yarmouth and Edinburgh. Johnston is six foot three, slim with short brown hair. He dresses smartly and has a Glaswegian accent and is thought to visit betting shops and racetracks. Call us if you know where he is or the whereabouts of any of our other photo call faces. Do call us straight away. The number is 01811 8055. That's 01811 8055. Well, our next reconstruction is of an armed raid on a bank near Edinburgh Airport, a robbery that must have been meticulously planned. And that's where maybe you can help. As you'll see, despite a silent alarm which secretly alerted the police, the gunmen managed to escape, and in a most unconventional way. They may well have driven over their escape route in advance. It took them through places where cars are rarely, if ever, seen, so if you saw them, you'd certainly remember. Our reconstruction begins on the day the robbery took place, two months ago. It's the afternoon of Monday, July the 10th. From its heart at the Castle Hill, Edinburgh stretches out through countryside to join with dozens of what were once small villages. This is Newbridge, bordering the airport on the city's western fringe. It's 20 past three and the Royal Bank is about to close its doors. Hello, Assistant Manager, can I help you? M2 Zerich to all vehicles stand by. That's a raid alarm in operation at the Royal Bank of Scotland. By now, five minutes had elapsed. The police were taking up positions in a cordon round the area, while other vehicles sped on towards the bank. Come on, move. A passing motorist saw the robbers running to their car. He watched in his rearview mirror as the gunman fell in behind him. Then they turned right towards Ratho Station. He decided to reverse and follow them. The robbers turned left into the grounds of the Norton House Hotel. The exit from the hotel is the A8, often clogged with traffic. Quite sure that the getaway car would be caught up in it, the witness abandoned the chase to let the police know where the robbers would be found. On the police! What? The speeding car attracted the attention of people in the grounds. All vehicles attending at the Royal Bank of Scotland, Newbridge, the Silver Astra has been seen entering the grounds of the Norton House Hotel. But still in the grounds of the hotel, the men abandoned the vehicle. Leonard Cuthbert walks his dog here every day, but rarely sees a car. In fact, it's so unusual, he was suspicious and told the police. 
From here, the robbers continued along farm lanes and across fields, turning left onto the Freelands Road. A panda car searching the area was looking for robbers in a silver Astra. Empty zone, to all vehicles attending the calls for Bank of Scotland. It's a lookout request for a red Astra, Echo 102, Bravo Delta Sierra. Hello Control, from Charlie 2, reference the bank raid at Newbridge. We're now in pursuit of red Vauxhall Astra motor vehicle, Echo 102, Bravo Delta Sierra. The vehicle is travelling east in Freeland Road towards Ingolston. From Charlie 2, over. Roger, Charlie 2. The Red Astra was last seen leaving Norton House, heading towards Ingolston. But that was the last the police saw of the robbers. What is now known is that they continued along minor roads to Roddinglaw, where again they took to farm lanes and the fields. Approaching the busy A720, they avoided traffic by driving underneath it through a pedestrian subway. Still using lanes and back roads, they drove onto the Sight Hill Industrial Estate. Later that afternoon, police found the car abandoned outside the Ethicon building on Bankside Avenue. Well, Mr Crookston, it was an elaborate getaway. It must have been planned in advance. It was well planned in advance, yes. It's an area where uh, courting couples go and where people regularly walk. Um, and I would ask anyone who was on these tracks that day uh, to get in touch with us. In fact, though, if it was planned in advance, we're not only talking about uh, July the 10th, the day of the crime, but uh, any, any time in weeks leading up to that. Days and even weeks before 10th of July, yes. Right. Perhaps the most public place, apart from the bank itself that day, where people, many people may have seen them, is at the Ethicon building, where they abandoned the Red Astra. That's right. The police recovered the Astra fairly quickly after the raid. Uh, it is an area which, as you've said, is very, very busy, and uh, people must have seen the men leave the car there. I would ask anyone who did see these people leave the car to contact us as soon as possible. Now, both cars were stolen from Glasgow, both on the same day, which was the 7th of July. Where exactly were they stolen from? That's right. The silver car was stolen from Anderston Quay in Glasgow and the red car from Hill Street. We are anxious to trace their movements, obviously, between the 7th and 10th July over that weekend. And again, if anyone saw them, uh, we would like to know about it. One thing, they didn't change the number plates of either of the cars. So if I could just tell you what the number plates are again. The Silver Astra's registration number is B37BYS and the Red Astra's registration number is E102BDS. So the cars are now back with their rightful owners. We're not interested in sighting since the 10th of July, but we do not want to know, we do want to know where those were between the 7th and the 10th. Yes, indeed. Do you have any descriptions of the men? Yes, we do. Uh, as one of the, the raiders was leaving the silver-coloured car to go into the bank, he pulled on a mask. He is described to us as being between 30 and 35 years of age, 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 8 in height. He has collar-length dark brown hair, a dark moustache, and the witnesses describe him as wearing Buddy Holly-type glasses, dark-rimmed glasses. And that particular man, I gather, was heard to call another man by name. The name Bobby was used during the raid in the bank. So it could be genuine or could have been a blind, you never know. We just don't know. And there's a reward, I gather? Yes, the banks have agreed uh, to pay up to £10,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the people responsible for this robbery. All right, well, Mr Crook Crookson, thank you very much indeed. Here's the number if you can help. It's 01811 here to the studio, or you can call the incident room in Edinburgh direct, and that is on 031 311 3211. That's 031 311 3211. Nothing tangible to tell you about calls coming in, but of course, as soon as there is news, I'll let you know. Let's now move to uh, Aladdin's Cave. Tonight, four police forces have pulled some of the precious and not-so-precious treasures that they've recovered. The collection has been gathered together at Peterborough Police Station, and John Bly from the Antiques Roadshow has travelled there to show them off and ask, is anything yours? Well, I'm going to start with a tea caddy. This one made about 1820. It originally had two boxes for the tea and a bowl in the centre for mixing it, or sugar. Those have long since gone, unfortunately, and inside now is what looks like a pile of junk, but never be put off by the looks. Here you've got the most wonderful example of a good old English pattern, serving spoon made in London in 1805. That spoon today, you know, is worth best part of 200 pounds. 
putting it back rather carefully. Then we've got a snuff box made the latter part of the Victorian period, and it was presented to D. Matheson by some friends as a token of esteem on the 26th of May, 1874. And here we've got a, an engraved flask which says, just J.M. from T.L. 1897. And we've got lots of porcelain from Japan, some pottery from China, and we've got here some Chinese-looking pottery. This, in fact, was made in Staffordshire in England about 1860, 1870. Inside, it's got a nasty sort of bubble in the glaze, and that might help identify it. Next to it, a very good blue and white Chinese porcelain dish made about 1760, 1770. And this had a lid, and you can tell that by this lip. Now, maybe the owner still has that. That's a very good piece of Chinese porcelain. Now, here we've got a suitcase. Now, I believe that suitcases these days are very fashionable. And this one belonged at one time to J.N. Tate. Inside it, we've got three volumes. This one is particularly good. Look at that wonderful binding, original binding, gold around the outside, inside here. And it's actually by Moore's Irish Melodies. Isn't that lovely? And you see it originally belonged to J.J. Hinson. Now, rather sadly, we've got a collection of old exercise books. They're absolutely worthless to anyone outside the family of the person who wrote them. In this case, James Oliver, who attended the Alderman Wraith School in Spennymoor. Let's hope that rings a bell. Now, if not the most valuable, certainly the most interesting to me, is this silver mug. It was made in 1742, and originally it was perfectly plain. Then, about a hundred years later, they put all this embossing and engraving on, and also a crest which might help with identification same time they gilded the inside and even with all this later work on it it's still worth between seven or eight hundred pounds and i bet a pint of beer tastes jolly good out of it too and here's the number if there's anything there you recognize 01 811 8055 or you can call thorpe wood police station on 0733 897 800 that's 0733 897 800 Incidentally, none of those items would be sitting there waiting to be claimed at all if they'd been marked with their owner's postcode. You can buy simple marker pens like these, which only show up under ultraviolet light. Here's the ultraviolet light. There are ceramic markers for glass and china and so on, and there are engravers for permanent visible marking on metal objects or plastic or wood. The crime prevention officer at your local police station will be only too pleased to call on you if you need any help or advice, and he or she will probably lend you the marking equipment as well. Incidentally, looking at the box, that ultraviolet lamp turns out to have other uses too. The makers describe it as a very useful aid in verifying counterfeit dollar notes. Indispensable. Now to incident desk. Without more ado, here's Superintendent David Hatcher. Thank you. First, a case which made national news headlines. It was the murder of pensioner Donald Kell. About 10.45am on Wednesday morning, the 26th of July, while out on an errand for a neighbour, Donald Kell was shot dead. He was trying to prevent an armed robbery of a Brinks map security van outside the Lloyds Bank in Finchley Road, Swiss Cottage, London. There was a tube and rail strike that day, but the buses were running and the streets were busy, so there must be a lot of witnesses who haven't yet got in touch. The two armed men escaped in a yellow Volkswagen Golf, registration number LKM851P. They abandoned it half a mile away behind Newton House on the Abbey Road estate, and probably transferred to a red saloon-type car. The last registered owner of the Golf sold it to an unknown man in May 1987, and the car looks as if it's been left out in the open and used very little over the period of the last two and a half years. But the Golf was seen in Moulton Avenue, Hounslow, Middlesex in May this year. Then, during June it, and July, it was seen three and a half miles away near Cranford School in Middlesex. The last sighting was on the 12th of July, in St Dunstan's Close, Cranford. The two robbers are both white, but tanned and have large beer bellies. One is between 30 and 45, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 9 tall. He had a London accent and was wearing a white shorts, t-shirt and trainers. The second man was slightly taller and about 40. He had a moustache and was wearing a royal blue floppy hat, sunglasses, a red shirt and blue shorts. Both men were carrying handguns. There is a £20,000 reward for information leading to conviction, so if you can help, please let us know. Our next case is a very serious attack on an Asian family in the Brick Lane area of London. 
we've reenacted what some witnesses saw immediately after the attack. As the appeals are directed towards the local community, a Bengali speaker will take us through the case. July মাসের 9 তারিখ রবিবার সন্ধ্যায় ওয়ারিশালির থান পরিবার সহ হোয়াইট চ্যাভেলের ফ্লাওয়ার এন্ড ডিনওয়াকে থান বাড়িতে আক্রমণ করা হয় আক্রমণকারী দুইজন খালা আর একজন সাদা আক্রমণে ইসমাত আলী মারা গেছেন আর থান বাগনা ওয়ারিশালিক এখনো খুব বেমার আক্রমণের একটু বাদে একজন সাদা মানুষ ফ্লাওয়ার এন্ড ডিনওয়াক থেকে দৌড়াইয়া আইয়া একজন খালা মানুষের লোকে মিলে আর দুইজনে দৌড়াইয়া গান্থ্রপ স্ট্রিটের দিকে যায় সাদা মানুষটার বয়স প্রায় বিশ বছর লম্বা ফাস্ট ফুড ছয় ইঞ্চি থাকি দশ ইঞ্চি চুল লম্বা আর পিছনে বান্ধ দেওয়া এই সময় একজন মানুষ পরিচয় না দিয়া ফোন করিয়া কইন থাইন থারারে দেখছই এই দুইজন সানি সারা সাদা গাড়ি সরিয়া হোয়াইট চ্যাপেল হাই স্ট্রিটের দিকে চলিয়া যায় গাড়ির নম্বরের কিছু অংশ ওই লো আটশো উননব্বই পরিচয় না দিয়া যে লোক ফোন করিয়াছিল দয়া করিয়া আরবার ফোন করুকা ঘটনার সময় আক্রমণকারী টাকা দাবি করে ওয়ারিশালি টাকা লেনদেনের ব্যবসা করেন সেই রবিবারে তার লগে আপনার লেনদেন হইয়া থাকলে ফোন করুকা একজন বাঙালি আপনার উত্তর দিবেন We have a Bengali speaker with us in the studio to take your calls. So if you can help in any way, please get in touch. There is a reward of £5,000. In our last case, we need your help to identify this man. Calling himself a winner and using a stolen cheque, he opened up a building society account in Hounslow, Middlesex. He returned on the 29th of March and withdrew the money, using it to buy a Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow. He then went on to sell the car for over £15,000. Well, he's in his mid-twenties, about 5 foot 10 inches tall, and has a London accent. If you recognise him, we'd like to hear from you. Perhaps with your help, the so-called Mr A winner could become a loser? Well, here's a number. If you can help on any of those cases, it's 01 811 8055. 01 811 8055. Of the calls coming in so far, the most promising seem to be uh, on photo call. We've got an address being given for one of the people uh, that the police were looking for. And as far as the couple are concerned, the Shields, uh, a cab driver reported driving them to a railway station recently. We've had a number of other sightings of them as well. A substantial number of calls on the Dixon case. And despite the enormous publicity the case has already received, we're already getting calls about the murder of Donald Kell, the pensioner who was shot as he tried to stop a robbery in North London. But there was another similar tragedy this summer in the capital which is what we turn to now a case in which a courageous young man received appalling head wounds one newspaper described him as a have a go tramp but the truth is that David Patterson had only been in London for five days and simply had nowhere to stay as you'll see in this reconstruction his heroism and that of other bystanders was by no means reckless and the fact that he was shot shows the urgent need to catch the gunman and remove him from being a grave danger. For security reasons, certain details have been changed for this reconstruction. David Patterson arrived in London from Scotland sometime around the 21st of June. He grew up in the Gorbals district of Glasgow. According to his uncle, he travelled down to London to busk and maybe make his fortune. I think he was hoping that someday we'd see him, you know, singing, playing the guitar, that somebody would pick him up. You know, uh, he's always wanted to make a tape or a, you know, a record. He's done a lot of busking in Scotland, singing in the pubs, and he uh, comes up to London, Manchester and Birmingham, because there's nothing in Scotland for him. Nothing. Since David probably had no money when he arrived, he spent his first night sleeping rough underneath the arches of the festival hall. The South Bank is almost always busy with hundreds of people visiting the many attractions. At lunchtime, there's live music at the festival hall, while underneath, crowds of youngsters gather to skateboard. At just after 10 to 2 on Monday, June the 26th, a couple visiting the Hayward Gallery remember passing a man dressed in combat clothing. The SAS. Fifty minutes later, at 2.40 p.m., a security van arrived at the National Theatre to collect the takings. Move along. 
along the van. Come on, move along, I said. Move it, quick. Move it, move it! Right. Put all the money in there, all of it, now. Stay exactly where you are. Come on, get the money in there. Come on, come on. Right, you're coming with me, come on. David was outraged that the couple had been threatened. David kept 30 feet behind the gunman, but it wasn't enough. On hearing that last gunshot, a security guard came out of the building opposite. He saw a man appear on level with Waterloo Bridge. A company executive returning from lunch also heard the shot and saw the man. The gunman made his escape along Waterloo Bridge, then down into a pedestrian subway called the Bull Ring. It's here that witnesses so far traced run out. The subway has many exits. Did he ride past you? David Patterson had been shot in the head with pellets scattered throughout the left side of the brain. The incident made headlines in London's evening paper and in the national press, and police hoped for a good response from the public. But someone somewhere was not pleased with the coverage. Four days later, a package was delivered to the offices of the London Evening Standard. It contained items stolen in the raid, along with doctored newspaper cuttings and a message punched on dino tape. Fired warning shots? I tell you what, uh, you prepare a story and get John Stevens to uh, alert the yard. Okay. Ten weeks later, David is still in hospital, seriously ill. David has certainly improved slightly since he's actually been in hospital, but he's still extremely poorly in many ways. He can't actually manage to walk on his own. Um, he's very weak down the left side, has no movement down that side at all. David feels very frustrated at times. He loved playing the guitar, and he can't accept the fact at the moment that he can't play that. His left hand is weak, he can't possibly hold the guitar, or is that. Um, he enjoyed walking as well. And all the things that one enjoys in life as a young person, he's unable to do. It's an appalling crime. Bill Mellish, you're convinced because of the, the gunshots, I gather, there are still more witnesses to come, come forward. A lot of people must have seen this. Yes, I think there was a lot of people out there that didn't perhaps appreciate the significance of what was happening or thought other people would come forward to police. The reality is that I want any witness that was out there that saw this guy without his balaclava. When he was chaining the bike up, when he was hanging around outside the Haywood Gallery for the hour before the robbery, or when he was making his getaway down Waterloo Bridge Road to the Bull Ring. Well, there we have a Crime Watch video fit. Now, uh, describe that man to us, what we know about him. White. 28 to 30 years, 5 foot 6, 5 foot 8 tall, very thin, very thick lips. Witnesses describe him as a Woody Allen look-alike. He's a wimp, a callous wimp at that. Now, we've got an artist's des uh, description of his, his bike as well, which might help. Yeah, it's a gent's black sit-up-and-beg bicycle. Significantly, it's got a basket on the front and the back. And an artist's impression, too, of the bag that he was carrying. We're not sure of the, the colour of that, I, I, I must be honest. Possibly greenish, but the shape's right. It's a sports bag, a gun bag, leg and mutton bag, something like that. Now, he is obviously, this man, desperately, uh, oddly upset about the press coverage, and hence, this is all the original stuff that he, he sent to the London Evening Standard. How That's can right. people help about this? I'd like somebody to tell me uh, where 
this has been together. They've seen this, uh, the jiffy bag, the dymo tape, the chocolate wrapper, the cuttings, all together in one place. I want to know where that was. Okay. Frequently on this program, surprisingly frequently, people with quite long criminal records and certain criminal associations ring up and say, I'm just not prepared to tolerate that sort of crime, that level of violence. Do you expect that might happen in this case? I honestly believe there's, there's family, friends or associates out there that know this guy, know the identity of this guy. What I say is the next time he goes out with a loaded uh, repeater shotgun, he's going to kill someone. I'd like to know who he is. I'd like them to give him up. There's a substantial reward up to £15,000 uh, being offered for his arrest and conviction. I'd like that information, please. All right, well, here's the number. Straight here to the studio, 01811 If you prefer, you can call the incident room on this case direct. That's another London number, 01230 That's 01230 -2061. Well, calls still steadily coming in on all tonight's cases. On the Edinburgh armed robbery, the Royal Bank near the airport there, one caller recognised the video fit of the man with the Buddy Holly glasses and has given police detailed information which they're now following up. On uh, our photo call, Gordon Johnston, there have been sightings of him reported in pubs in the Blackpool area as recently as last Sunday. And on the murder of Mr and Mrs Dixon, overall we've had a substantial number of calls and many suggestions as to sightings of that cyclist, but nothing, I'm afraid, specific at the moment. But so far, that's it for the moment. Our lines are open until midnight tonight. All the relevant police numbers are on CFAX, page 186 if you have that, or write to us if you can't get through by phone. The address is Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London W12 7RJ. If you'd like to find out what's happening with the calls that are coming in behind me now, do stay up for Crime Watch Update, which is at 11.35. And if that's uh, beyond your bedtime, let us remind you that, as always, uh, we show what tend to be uh, exceptional crimes, the ones police are especially anxious to solve, and we pack them in so as to cover as many appeals as possible. Mercifully, they are not the norm. Far from it. So don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night.